All right, guys. All right, back, back here with the, uh, now the, we're gonna start with the Rook Engen part of this lesson, of this master class. Uh, I hope you guys uh, learned something from the Keen Engens. Now, that doesn't mean that we are completely off the Keen Engens, uh, because we're actually gonna, uh, we're actually gonna be looking at some Rook Engens that could have, could have transposed, uh, could have got into some Keen Engens. You have to know King Engens before you understand Rook Engens. Because everything, everything relates to each other. Okay. Uh, now, from from the engines you need to learn in your life, uh, I would suggest you do uh, king engines and rook engines first, because that those are the most typical engines you're gonna find in your daily games. I play rook engines and king engines almost every every single day. Uh, so here we go, guys. Um, the master class, the part of the. Uh, rook and games uh, starts here and we're gonna start with some basic ones first just like what we did with the king and game so that you guys understand what uh, for our, our uh, yeah for the for um, yeah so for the most complicated ones and we have a tons tons of really good end games uh, very recent uh, from the top players uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get there so the, this one is very easy, uh, it's a draw, okay? Uh, all I want to point out is that if you have a rook pawn and you got a rook, king rook versus uh, king rook and pawn, uh, this is a dead draw because there's no way to make progress, okay? You can do a7, I can go king a8, and all I have to do here is stay, stay with the rook on the 8th rank by moving my, my rook back and forward, back and forward, back and forward. And it is a very easy draw okay uh, this one the same technique the same technique is the same this is a this is a good good C nation this is called the pa passive defense of rook end games now you are not supposed to defend passively any type of end game but this is an exception to a rule and of course that is because it's a rook pawn now if we continue with this this one is exactly the same. It is a knight pawn, it's white to move, white goes rook g7, but it doesn't change anything because you can never get me out of this two square. Now, the, the most important part though is that rook b7 check, you don't wanna go to c8 because then you lose the game. I go rook c7 then I kick you out of here and then I can promote. You have to go to a8. Right, always, always stop the king from getting active. Remember about the opposition? Well, it's kind of similar here. You want to put the king where the king, the other king cannot improve. That's it, it's a dead draw. There's no way to get me out, and so the game is a dead draw. That's it. So, again, another example of a passive rook. Okay, we're gonna be looking at also some next one here and, and this one is uh, is is actually not a yeah so we're gonna start here we're gonna start here where is is black to move okay and uh, the, the, this end game is not an easy is, is an easy win but a lot of people will get confused and they don't know uh, what uh, how they don't know how to win so if you are playing black here uh, this is already lost but you have to know one thing if you go rook a7, so let's say, sorry, let's say I go, uh, I play, let's say I go here. Let's say I go rook a7. This is what I want to do, right? I want to do, I want to do, I want to do c7. I want to do c7, and then I go rook a8, and that's it. That's how I kick you out, right? But the problem is that I don't let you do that because I can play a move like rook f6. So you cannot win this if you do it slowly with rook a7 you have to give me a check first this is the key you give me a check intermediate check before you do anything else and then when you go king a8 i go rook a7 check king b8 and then now i can do it because i just check and check and take the rook and win now if the king is on if you king goes to c8 i still do exactly the same it's not a check but it is very forced because I am trying to go rook a8 and I win. So king b8 is the only move, c7, and that's it. It's a winning endgame for white. Now, this one though, 
what this shows you is that if you're playing, if you're playing, uh, uh, if you have a bishop pawn endgame, rook pawn and king versus king and rook, you cannot hang out passively in the eighth rank because you lose the game. You have to play different. You have to apply some other techniques that are more active, like the rook behind the pawn checks, checks from behind, right? Or lateral checks. You have to apply one of those too because if he just sits there, you lose the game. It's not possible to make a draw here. All right. So why wins this one? Let's keep going with more, a little more complicated ones. And this one is a classic. Is the Philidor, uh, the Philidor position uh, of of rook end games. Everyone should know this one because it's the simplest drawing theoretical ga end game that uh, happens almost an, uh, to every every person in in, in, in the chess. You know, it's, it's it's hard not to get an end game like this. Okay, it doesn't have to be the E pawn, it could be the B, it could be the C, it could be the D, it could be any pawn. You can apply the exact same technique, and that is the Philidor technique. So what's the Philidor technique? I'm trying to push this pawn, right? Alright, so but what happens if I go, I don't know, it looks like if I go rook A1, rook A1 seems like a great move, right? But the problem is that I go rook G7 check, and let's say you go here, it's time to step on the promotion, now King F8 is possible. Then now I can go king d6, and this is exactly where the problem uh, starts. You see, this is not a knight pawn and it's not a rook pawn. So when you go check, I go e6, and as you can see, you run out of checks. Now I'm gonna try to checkmate you, and so I'm completely winning here. You have to go backwards, and then I go here, and again, I kick you out of the promotion square, and I win. If you go check from behind, which would be the only move you can do to survive, I go king e6, and again, what happened? I stop your checks, and now I'm mating you again. So I will be able to get you out of the promotion square. That's why the Philidor technique takes care of this. The best move here is the move rook h6. Now, what's the beauty of this move? The beauty of this move is that now I don't let you go forward with your king, even if you check me. You can check me, I go down to e8, I control the 6th rank, and now what are you going to do to improve if you cannot go forward with your king? You're going to have to, at some point, push your pawn. It's the only way. Now you can stay here as well, but I stay as well. So we're just going to be moving the rook back and forward, back and forward, and there will be no progress for black, for white. So I go e6 at some point when I'm tired I will be going e6 and then once you go e6 now the square e6 is not a square where the king can go we go root g1 and this guys is the Philidor technique to make a very easy draw for uh, with black as you can see you go root d1 check and now there's no way to make progress if you go king d6 check and now I will give you a bajillion checks and you cannot hide on e6 see with the pawn on e5 i have king e6 now i don't have king e6 so the position is a dead draw try to draw boom boom i just check 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 so it's not all about giving checks guys for those of you who are uh, learning endgames uh, a lot of the time uh, you just have to do a precise move checks are not always good and you only do them when they're necessary in the right time check check checks is not always good in fact it's most mostly uh, probably most of the time are bad so checks can only prove the kings the, it's not that good so going next now hopefully you guys remember cut off the king you don't you don't necessarily have to wait to the sixth rank to apply this angle you can do it on the fourth on the third it doesn't matter all of them you can apply the exact same technique of checks all right but this is the worst case scenario where this point is as far advanced as possible you still make a very easy draw. So now we go back to uh, this one. And this game is a very easy example for why. Why is practically completely winning here. But it is important to see why and the, the, the reason. I want, you guys, I want you guys to start thinking about, about why, about you know detecting when you're completely winning or when you have an incredible chance of winning. And that is the case for white. So black. White's next move shows off pretty much all the problems. Uh, white goes rook d6, 
and uh, black has a b6 weakness a g6 weakness which is basically tying up the king and tying up the rook tying up meaning the king and the rook both the king and the rook for black they're both passive and so white is practically winning here you're just going king c4 king e5 king c6 and then that pawn oh is gonna be lost then you're gonna promote very easy but i do want to show you the best defense technique here even though it's losing because i want you to start thinking this way so when you play when you're playing a, a rook end game you need to think about activity as if as if it means material because that's what it is it is almost like you're up material or you are down material so like in this case the rook activity pretty much give white material it's, it's like being up a pawn or up a rook or something now the best way you can do this is by activating your own rooks as well so if you are playing a, a rook end game like this it's better for you 99% of the cases to give up the pawn and become active because if you stay this king is gonna get too active and then you're gonna lose the pawn anyway and then you're gonna lose the game so it's gonna be a lot easier this one for example here will be the best move now in this game is over anyway because you see I'm taking this guy now who is gonna stop this baby no one will and black uh, is also cut off which is the worst thing you can do on any end game and then just pushing and pushing this guy will be more than enough and maybe I complicated this a little more than it seems but it is easy win because this king is too close as you can see the white uh, king gets up just in time it's very very easy again but it does show you something that we're gonna be seeing a lot today is that that this rook is very active and this rook is very passive on top of that the king is passive too so it's just just winning all right so we're gonna go to another example and this is also a classic that you have to know and uh, if you remember the previous game that we saw this one where my goal here is to basically kick you out right that's my goal no if I can kick you out of here then you can get to what we're gonna see which is the Lucena position now this is better if you play here but the idea is that once in, I'm in the Lucena position wait, wait, wait. I, I can win this game very easily so what I want to get is the king here the pawn here and then start with the Lucena position and that's what we're gonna see that's what can come up if you don't defend correctly so we're gonna go forward with this and now we are in the Lucena position what is the Lucena position I know a classic technique basically this king cannot get out because um, because you don't have a way to get out that's it the king this king takes care of this side this rook takes care of this side so how you get out well first step is three steps here one you give a check to the king so the king have to get away and now you give yourself you give yourself a little escape here with the king on e7 king d6 king d5 blah 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 and now what do you do with white well with black you have nothing to do you have to kind of stick around here but then the second steps comes in even if i make this move you would just hang around here there's nothing for there's, there's, there's nothing for uh uh there's nothing for uh black to do or than staying in this column and staying with the king here now the the one thing though is that there is a little threat if you try to go king e7 now uh rook d8 check king e7 rook d1 check and then you try to get better here you're not you're not going to because i will give you checks and as you can see you cannot get away from this pawn because my rook gets it so now is when the second step comes in getting out here is too early so you have to go boom rook f5 oh you can also do the move rook f4 it doesn't matter either one wins but rook f4 is nice and now i'm gonna get my king out and then i will block the checks with the rook which is the third step so we are on second step rook f4 put the rook on the fourth rank fifth rank and then now it is time to get the king out finally works because now checks king d5 checks the rook is not here and now i can go rook d4 and the pawn is gone okay so these remember guys that i'm showing you this end games because i i i think from my own experience 
if you don't know these end games, then you will understand why at the highest levels you, you look at, a, at an end game and people uh, people will um, will simply uh, will simply resign and then you are like why the heck did this guy resign? Uh, why the heck did this, this guy resign? It's, it makes no sense. Uh, thanks for the bits, Night Free. Uh, thanks for all of you guys uh, for watching. So they resign because this is a, this is an easy endgame for them and you just don't know it. So that's it. It's, it's, a, it's a basic endgame that if you study it well, then a lot of the other endgames will make more sense. All right. So going forward, we're gonna see another example of a passive passive rook versus a passive uh, uh, sorry active rook. Now this rook is a special. Okay, I want you to look at this rook because this rook is extremely strong. We got a rook on the seventh rank, and for those of you uh, who don't know, the seventh rank is probably one of the best, if not the best, place for a rook to be because all of the pawns are there. So all of the pawns are there, and with that rook, with that rook, if you, I mean, if you have most of the time, you can have all your pawns on the seventh rank, or at least eighty percent of your pawns will be there, and so if you do that then what, what that means is you're going to be able to attack every single one of the black pawns. Now, worst case scenario, the pawn moves, well, you can still attack the pawn from behind. And attacking from behind or lateral are the best types of attacks in chess, especially for a rook, okay? It's the most active way to attack. So, it is extremely important for white in this position to, to leave that rook on, on the seventh rank, okay? So, you don't want to move that rook there, so you need to do whatever you need to do to leave it there. Black is trying to go king d8, kick the rook, and then black is fine. It's really all about the, the rook, and you need to understand when things are that important. This position is either, can I keep my rook on, on the seventh rank and be better on possibly winning? Can I not? And then the end game is most likely a draw or very hard to win for white. That's why white came up with this awesome idea of bishop b5 check, almost like forcing the king to go here, king f8, and now boom, d6. The boom move, pawn d6, amazing. And now if you take the pawn, well, you have to take, otherwise I take the pawn, pawn takes d6, then boom, bishop c4. The pawn on f7 is hanging. Only move is now bishop b6. Bishop takes bishop, pawn takes, and rook takes h7, and the game is over. Or practically over. I mean, it's never that easy, but you see what you see. My point: Why manage to keep the rook on the seventh rank? And this is huge because not only I'm making this guy passive, but I'm also making this king passive because it's cut off. And now you know who's not passive? This other king. Next thing you know, my king is gonna go forward and it's gonna get on f6 and this endgame is over. Alright? A very nice passive example of a rook endgame. So never this is like the worst thing, the worst position you can possibly have for black on a rook endgame. Never get into this type of position. So next game, another uh, example of a seventh rank rook. And this was actually my own game back in the day in Puerto Rico, 2015, against a 2000, maybe 2000 something rated guy. I, I went into this endgame knowing that, you know what, I'm, I'm practically winning here. And uh, also I was playing a lower rated guy. But you know what, I didn't mind to go into a very simple position like this because I knew I was going to win this. Now, what is, my, what is my idea here? My idea is to not let this rook out. I want to make sure this rook stays passive as well as well as this king so black goes so my next move is a5 uh, because black was trying to play the move b5 right if you play b5 I go c5 and the game is pretty much over I also and uh, then I take the pawn and you see you gotta go here and I go here this is just bad really bad and on top of that your king is cut off so that's, there's nothing for you to do here. Keeping the file closed so that the rook cannot get in, all right? So my opponent goes c5, only move to, again, play the move b5. And now I go rook c7, attacks the pawn. I'm gonna get at least one pawn out of this activity. So he goes a6, only move because if you play b6, 
I go a6. Click the, if you play b5, I also go a6, pawn takes, and now I got this awesome rook takes. And remember what we said about the cutoff king? There's no way to stop this a7, check, a8, promotion. So white goes, black goes a6, rook takes pawn, b6, and now rook c6, and I get this tactic where I'm finally up two pawns, and then I won the game. Uh, the game uh, lasted a little, a little longer than that. It was like 20 something, uh, 20 almost 20 more moves. But the thing is that we transform a seventh rank rook with no pawns for a up two pawns position. That's how big. That's how big how inactive rook is in chess. Okay. We're gonna continue seeing some theoretical stuff and also some. Um, this one is a very nice game by Navara versus Jovava. He um, Navara completely crushed them. But what I want to show you is the final position where um, White goes Rook H1 here, and what a waste of time it seems like. Black goes here, and I go Oh Rook H1. It's almost like I'm doing nothing, uh, but I'm actually doing a lot. You go. Uh, what are you, what are you gonna do? You can go rook b1 now. That's one big thing. You can also do rook a7. This move is the typical tempo thing that I've been mentioning all night. A tempo, gaining a tempo is extremely important in chess sometimes because you need a certain position to happen when it's your opponent's move or when it's your move. And for that, you need to waste time to then gain the position that you want. So rook h1, gaining a tempo, and now black, is almost in Suksun. You can go move the rook, in which case I'm gonna go rook a7 and then the amazing g5 move. Again, Suksun for black. There's no way. Uh, you can go rook e7, you can go move the king. I'm still gonna do the exact same move, f5. And this is huge, huge example of king and rook activity. Black is totally getting crushed here. The question is how can I get in? And that is what he did f5 is amazing now uh why black made a blo big blunder here and took this pawn and then g6 and then is is just it i mean it's just over i don't know why he took with the g pawn uh, he could have could have taken with the e pawn but then e6 rook takes rook takes and once again the king is too active the rook is too active this pawn is winning because you see in the in the previous game that we looked into a philidor defense with the rook on the sixth rank uh, that one was was good it worked great but that's when there were no pawns these pawns now are covering the sixth rank so there's no way for you to break through with this check you're gonna hide from the checks because let's say you cannot go forward well, you could go forward but i'm go i'm gonna go c5 three and now i can do something like king d6 and then whenever you push, I take again, and that's it. I'm, I'm I'm gonna hide very easily from the checks because you don't have anywhere to go. And then I would take this pawn too. So it's a very nice angle by David Navarra. Also has some really cool value on the bishop g5, um, on the bishop g5 classical Sicilian. I would recommend that one. Now our next game is a is a theoretical uh, winning example that I want to show you guys because it's important for you guys to know. Of course, otherwise I wouldn't. So, what do we have here? Uh, this this uh, is a is a winning, a very easy winning example. But once again, we need we need that king. You cannot win this game if you don't bring the king into the help. Okay. So, what can you do here? Well, you got you want to keep that pawn alive, and you also want to keep this pawn as much as you can. But this pawn is only gonna be a distraction. What you really care. It's about getting that king to the move to the square b1 so that you can promote otherwise how are you gonna do it not there's no way this if this was not here it would have been is is an easy um is an easy draw for black for white but because this rook this point exists this point is gonna distract this king this rook is already distracted it cannot move from the this column because of the promotion so as the, i so this is just an example it could have been gone in many ways but the idea is that I'm gonna start bringing my king slowly, slowly up the hill here. Boom, 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 and then promote. But when you try to get the pawn, I'm not gonna let you, I'm just gonna protect. When you try to get too close, 
I always give you my checks here and I push that pawn so that it's just a distraction I, I'm not gonna do anything with that pawn and then when I'm when I get tired of that I will just give it up and go forward and that is it so so what what was this it, it seemed long it seemed it might seem even hard but really all it takes all it took to win this game is one idea so one idea and you guys can come up with a winning plan how do you get to how do you get how do you make those decisions in in a, in a game well you gotta you gotta think about you gotta find the winning position and then you work on how to get there so finding find the the winning position here would be how can i get the king to be one but you have to you have to realize that if you get the king to be one you win and that's it okay so a very nice very easy really end game but finding the king be one idea is, the, is the, the most important thing so now when we go to the next one we're looking to a even easier one because now you don't even need the king this one is a theoretical winning end game because white oh sorry because black all black has to do is push those pawns and then there is a check coming with a winning game so what can you do well you can you can try to pin me if you want it doesn't matter i move i will move my king away i will do everything i need you can never take this pawn because i just move away and then i promote and then i I'm, i have a king on rook versus king end game that we all know is winning so you have to you can pin me but you're gonna run out of checks i'm gonna go all the way here but when you're done giving me checks I will just push my pawn and then we're gonna get to this position and the, now you're gonna see why this is winning you have only two uh, squares that you can stay you gotta you get if you want to make a draw here go try for a draw you gotta go king h2 king g2 king h2 king g2 it's the only way now you cannot stay there and that's the problem you can go here or you can go here but then i would just push my pawn and win and then you can also take the pawn well the thing is that anytime you are out of the second second rank here i give you a check and i promote so that wins the game right now the other thing you can do is go to f2 so i don't have this check but then i have this awesome idea root h1 boom you have to take the pawn otherwise i promote and then check and that rook is gone guys so a skewer a very nice a very nice uh now all of the things are are theoretical and and they're once you learn them they're not hard you just have to kind of memorize the typical tactics here and and then you will start realizing those patterns but you do have to know them otherwise how are you gonna know if you're winning like if i set up this position you should be able to just tell me black is winning without even thinking because it is winning now we're gonna go to the next one and look at the difference huge difference is a knight pawn and the same thing happened if it's a rook pawn okay you have an engine like this you by default know i know that this is a dead draw okay well first of all if i move this rook away and i give up this pawn then you know that the end game is a draw anyway because we are playing that end game is in the first thing that we saw today where there was a knight pawn and all i have to do is stick around with my passive rook i don't even have to do anything like this i do is sit there and the game is a very easy draw now this one is not that simple because i have an extra pawn the problem is that well obviously you're not gonna, you're not gonna move here because then you lose the game that's 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 why you cannot move out of the eighth rank but also king f2 will do the same trick the problem though is that white doesn't have to move the king white or can just stay behind this pawn and you cannot force me to get out of these two uh, squares i can go you can go uh g5 and i go rook here and i go g4 and i just ignore this pawn i don't take it i just leave it there and just move my rook now if you try to bring your king closer i'm gonna wait for it the only way you can win this is by getting this king to b3 right now if i don't do check here now you're gonna go root b1 or root somewhere and then you promote and you win the game but whenever you get close enough i just give you a check and i make sure you get out of here once you separate enough i just go back and that's it 
So I keep your rook passive there. I might keep my, I keep my rook giving you checks whenever you, be, you get close to the pawn. And the game is a draw. Okay? So you need to get... These are things you just have to know. Again, no, no... Uh, now, uh, no, this is another classic endgame. And all I want to mention about this is that this game can be a draw if well played. But it is extremely complex. And I don't want to go into... Uh, into this much, but if you want to find more information about this, uh, the, uh, the, the Dorebsky books are very good. Uh, he goes into these lines, into these angles like, all the way, and there's a lot of information out there too. So, but it's definitely worth taking a look at it. There, there are different uh, if there is a B pawn, if it's a C pawn, and uh, very well explained by Dorebsky and in on his endgame books. But it's still a very, a very typical endgame. You get this a lot. A lot uh, if you play you know if you play enough games especially on, on blitz so a uh, black white can win this you have to basically use the king and it's the only way you can win or at least you can try so we're gonna but we're gonna keep going uh, I want to show you some more theoretical stuff before we go into more practical games this one here is a theoretical win is is one of those rare rare cases of uh, black uh, why win, winning a position where uh, you don't have um, you have a rook pawn and it's not very usual because uh, because you don't have uh, usually rook pawns are the worst pawns ever but in this case the king cannot make it on time to get to uh, c7 so why is c7 so important well we're gonna see we're gonna see that basically you need to get this king out all right and the only way you can do that is by putting that rook on b8 or b7 so you can get out you have to block this rook otherwise you won't be able to get out so black goes rook c8 it doesn't matter which rook but the, the thing is that you have to put the rook on the a frame and then as soon as you do that boom and i'm getting my king out that is how you win this game there are some there might be some tricks here uh but it doesn't matter i go king b7 i got my king out Watch out when you made it. But there's also check and check, and that's it. And I finally won. I mean, it took a little while because there were some tricks, but why promotes and wins the game. Now, we look at the next one, uh, it's a little different because now the king is one step, one column closer. So when you try to go around, I catch you and I don't let you go out like that. So you don't have. You don't have the move king b8, sorry, rook b8. I move my rook away, and now you don't have the move king b7, so you cannot get out. Give me a check. Watch out, don't go up because then I go up. You go down, you go, uh, so you go up actually. Don't go down because then I get out. And that's it. Check, back, back, dead draw. So that that's that's the that's this is what uh, these are things you just have to know as well. I mean, you just gotta, you can also calculate them. I mean, it's all these engines are all. A theory that helps you make quick decisions based on knowledge but if you don't know them you can always calculate it is very possible to calculate these things because basic but you have to know where you're going you know that in this case the only way you can make a draw is if you get here whenever white plays rook b8 now can you get there that's the question you calculate and if you cannot get there then you know you're lost and if you can't get there well then you're then it's a draw always calculate but know where you're going that's the most important thing now this is another example that is is, is a lot more difficult than the previous one i show you where the rook was on b6 why is a lot more difficult for white because the rook is more active if if you have to define activity on rook endgames the rooks are usually more active when there is a lateral uh, lateral defense like this rook is in, in the lateral defense position is a lot more active than if the rook is in front of the pawn the best position here will be the rook behind now we're gonna see some games today of the highest level guys with the rook behind that will be the best not because it's that active but because it makes the other rook passive then the rook will be on a8 or a7 that will be a horrible position the, th the problem with this way is that this rook is pretty active because he attacks the pawn and it attacks this guy too so you cannot activate the king without giving up this pawn, and that makes everything a lot more complex. This, this again, this endgame can be can be winning, uh, could be winning if white plays well, but, and black doesn't play very well. But it is it is very likely a draw 
uh, even if both players walk uh, play correctly. So it is it is a draw in fact. So going forward with this, it's just another example of activity. I mean, who is winning here? Well, obviously, uh, Y has better chance to win. But what can you do here? Would you sit around here and wait for this king to go forward and kill you, or would you activate your rook and become act and and, and do something that matters? Well, you got You got to do something that matters. And of course, if you stay around here, you will get destroyed. I mean, I can make a couple of moves here, like the prophylactics. But at some point, I would need this king to push those guys. Otherwise, I won't be able to win. So you better do rook d8 as soon as you can, and boom, rook d2. Rook c6, rook b2, and now, now you're creating yourself chances of drawing. This, this position, it is a draw, okay? Because this king, maybe you, maybe you can try for a win, but it's very, very difficult, okay? So... Always, always become active, even at the cost of a pawn, right? Don't just sit there around and wait for a pawn, for, for this king to come in, lose the pawn, and then the king will be there ready to promote. So remember that this, this pawn cannot promote without the help of the king. So if, if you lose the pawn and the king is already here, you're, you're worse than if... He, or you took the, he takes the pawn and your rook takes that guy while this king comes in. That's what you're going for here, okay guys? So let's go for the next one. And okay, this is the same one that we looked and this is the same one draw. And this one is, a, is, a, is, an, is an old one that, uh, but okay, I wanna show you guys this one because we talked about the pawn, this position before. And I just wanna make sure that you guys remember. And the question is, would you play a2 here? Would you play the move a2? That would be my question. Here. Think about the games we, the end games that we looked before, and see if you can win with playing a2. And the answer is no. Obviously not. If you play a2, we're back into that end game where we know it's a theoretical draw because you cannot improve your king, you cannot push this pawn anymore. You're done. And again, if you have 10 seconds left and you have to make a move, you know for a fact that a plain a2 is a draw. So why would you do that? Now, what is the only chance you got here? Is bring this king. Remember the, the idea? Of um, of using this king and then to help the king to push that pawn is the only way. Is the only way you can win this game. So that is exactly what Black did. So if you want to play this, you got to start going up, going up, going up, even at the cost of giving up a pawn. Now, would you play a2? No. Is it is a lose? Is a lost position because then rook h2. But you play king e4. Now this can still be a draw if well played, but. Actually, no, no, I, I made a mistake here. This is not right. Um, I, I would not give up that pawn that easy. So basically, I would try to make, this is part, possibly a draw, but the idea is that whenever you get that pawn, I would I would bring my rook quickly to c1, and then I would try to bring the rook to c3. So that if you go check, I go to c3, and now you notice how my king finally got active. So I'm not gonna let you bring my king in, and this is the only way you can win. Now. I don't care if this is a win or this is a draw, but knowing knowing what you can do to try to win helps a lot. And if, if you know this is a draw, and you know that the only chance you got is bringing the king closer so you can hide it here, then that's what you need to do. Uh, and you don't even have to think about this. This is something you just do based on knowledge, okay? So that even if you got a 10 second, uh, 10 second left game, you still do what you need to do because you just know it, okay? So, going forward with some uh, some games here, and uh, I think this is uh, what, what was this game? No, wait, let's let's go forward with this. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you some. Um, okay, so this is no, this is the game we just saw. Wait one second, let me uh, one second, guys. Let me do. A review. We're gonna start looking at some 
also make samples and here we go yeah we will find there i don't know why all right so now that we're done there we're gonna start looking at these are these are well, what we just did was looking at the uh basics some of the basics some of those engines that you just have to know and from now on we're gonna start looking at some more complex ones these are gonna be samples from uh, uh where is this one second from from real games and a lot of them will be based on some of those ideas all right all right guys so now you are seeing a magnus game that was played pretty recent i'm not sure why it's in that one second uh wait we'll go next some time issues seeing this all right here we go all right so we're gonna see a, a magnus game start with the magnus game alan picot uh Okay, I'm gonna do that again. Actually, yeah, okay. Sorry, I had to close the thing and it did a little funny thing here, but I'll be back in the game. Where's. And, um. Uh, here we go, Hanna Pika again against Magnus Carlson. All right. So. All right. All right. So, so anyway, here we are. Here we are. And Magnus won this game. And again, these are very recent. Recent games, uh, as you can see, we're to that is November or September 25, 2019. And what is what is Black uh, what is Black trying to do here? Uh, well, I'm trying to push maybe create a pass pawn. The the end game should be a draw if well played, but um, Magnus uh, Magnus won this one. So um, you know it's a blitz game and all the stuff, but. Um, but still, beating this guy is, is not an easy. So what what can you do if you're white? He's white to move. Uh, it would be nice to trade these two pawns, right? Trade all of these pawns would be great. Two versus three should be a theoretical draw, and that's kind of what happened in the game. So he played rook e5, rook c2, rook takes pawn, rook takes pawn, rook takes pawn, rook takes pawn, and now we are playing a dead drawing game, or what is supposed to be a dead drawing game, uh, and now black goes h5 so you're gonna see at some point black when f5 sorry f5 so what is what is black trying to do here king here and king here and then rook here and activate the king uh still not a winning end game uh Ma magnus goes rook here and now he could have if you take if you take that pawn i go king g5 and then you lose right this example is a little weird because uh because Magnus won this game, but you, you're gonna see what White could have done to defend this endgame. So anyway, there were some some moves, and at the end, you always want to be active with your rook, and that's one of those things that uh, well we've been looking at all, all night already, and how the best way to get an active rook is to have the option of attacking your opponent's pawns. Magnus is black, yes. You can see it on the name on the bottom of the of the board. Magnus is trying to go up with the king. Why does the job of attacking the pawn on g6? Because that's the base pawn. That's the one that is weak. If you go there, and I'm just gonna stay with my rook until you will get tired or give me checks. At some point, you're gonna have to do the move g5. Well, g5, pawn takes, pawn takes. It's good to trade pawns. It's always good to trade pawns. But then now, you gotta do something important here. You gotta attack one of these guys. But you have to calculate. Which, which pawn you, you should you attack? Should attack the F pawn or the G pawn? So white say rook F6, attack the pawn, king G4. And this is the moment where uh, this guy Picot, ma Picot makes the blunder move. He goes rook F8, double question mark. And now he lost the game. Now this was a blitz game. I'm sure if he's playing a, a, a real, you know, long, long game. 
he would have uh, he would have uh, draw this easily. But he blunder. He plays rook f6, and now Magnus goes check. Rook g3, thinking that king f2 would do the job because if you do rook takes g3, I go rook takes f5, and as you can see, we get into those king end games that we looked in the king end game master class. So he cannot do that. The problem is that you have an intermediate check, rook f3. And that's it. That's it. Rook f3, check, intermediate, and then rook takes g3, and black won the game. I mean, seriously, crazy, crazy. Now, what was the easy draw for black, for white? It's not. It doesn't look that easy, but it is an easy draw. Instead of rook f8, he should have gone rook g6. He attacked the wrong pawn. He should have done the g5 pawn instead of the g3. Because now, when you go check, you notice how if you get this guy, I get this guy, right? So you have to go rook e2, whatever. You can do whatever you want. I'm just going to stay around here attacking the g pawn. Whenever you try to go rook e3 to get my pawn, I make sure you don't give me a check. I go king h2. And then if you take the g3 pawn, once again, I got the awesome rook takes g5. And the game is over. It's draw. Then you can do checks, it doesn't matter. I'm just gonna keep moving my rook around until you get tired and take the pawn or push the pawn, which brings us back to uh, to these end games that we were looking at today. And that is an easy draw, okay? So, great stuff. Also, Magnus is so lucky, you know, you, I mean, you gotta be lucky sometimes to win, uh, even, even at the highest level, knowing that this was a draw. Now, next game, Neponyashi and another Magnus game, but this one is on the defensive side. Um, Magnus is definitely one of the best players in the world playing end games, and of course, well, we're gonna be looking at his games today for for a while because uh, I mean it's pretty awesome. So, what is Black trying to do here? Well, what is White trying to do? Uh, remember, I told you guys if you're playing these type of end games and you got a pass pawn, the best way to activate your rook is to put the rook behind the pawn that is already passed. Not because it's the most active position for the rook, because sometimes, uh, because really the most active position for the rook will be attacking some of your opponent's pawns. That will be more active, but it's not about your rook, it's about your opponent's rook. If this king is far away enough, putting the rook behind your own pawn secured a passivity for this other rook. And now you have a huge problem because your rook is too passive behind uh, protecting his pawn so then but here's the thing what else can you do after that nothing you gotta sit down and try to wait or you need to bring the king guys again the king and the king and the king or well, why is gonna be doing king here king here king here and then try to go king b5 now luckily for magnus here he doesn't have he doesn't have a way to uh black why doesn't have uh, because of this extra pawn here why have to waste time going here and then why is not gonna have time to go grab all the pawns the position is gonna be a draw so he goes here 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 and look at this king d5 guys super important move because uh because why because why doesn't have the uh, sorry why doesn't have a way to get to b5 so what does uh nebo go he tries to go for the for the other way no you're gonna play h6 gonna play h6 and now h4 king e6 maybe go this way what was the move for threatening h5 right so you're trying to play h5 here pawn takes king takes and then try to distract you see this pawn is distracting the rook and this rook takes care of this pawn and also take care of this guy so if i manage to create a pass pawn on this side white is completely winning because this rook and this king are gonna be busy taking care of this guy. But of course, Magnus is too strong. He doesn't let this king go anywhere. If h5, g5, then I create the pass pawn. So g4, pawn takes pawn, king takes pawn, king e5. Once again, no pass pawns on this side for Nebo. And he ends up just making, um, it, was, it ended up being a relatively easy draw for Magnus because actually Magnus kind of for, tried to win this because he could have just easily played g5 he didn't he played h5 instead and 
G5, the, 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 the nice move of the end G5, which makes uh, that draw because now both players promote at the same time and the game was a draw. So a very nice, a very nice defense for Magnus here because he, I mean, he could have lost this game. If this pawn was here on, was not on D6, the end game was definitely lo losing for uh, for Black. So that pawn saved uh, white posi uh, black position, but also the way he deal with the king, he never let the king get to B5, okay? So it's the only way you can win. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you. And then, oh man, I closed this. No, tell me that I close this again. No, okay, sorry. Ah, what did I do? Now we're looking at a Kramnik. We're gonna be looking at a Kramnik Mamediarov uh, game. Oops, Kramnik Mamediarov game. Uh, let's do this. And um, all right, and we're gonna be. All right, so Kramnik Mamediarov game that uh, was was relatively easy for White, but not really. You have to do some work. So remember the the, the rook technique that we just saw on the Nepo, ne Nepo game, where uh, where the uh, white put the rook behind. Okay, we've we've been repeating that for uh, pretty much the whole night. Why uh, played the move rook c4, rook b7? Sorry. So what is white doing? Well, sometimes you cannot keep the pawns. Sometimes you try you you can give up the pawn, but the idea. Is to get rid of this guy but then take the other pawn on b4 and that's why rook b7 was played to trade the advantages so now i'm up a pawn but it's not just about these pawns that is the fact that they're connected if this pawn was here this position was probably a draw but the problem is that these guys are connected okay you still have to play well so he played e5 a4 and now black could have played actually black kind of made a mistake here with e5 he could have gone rook d2 and try to go active behind. Instead, he played the move e5. That was a big blunder because look what happened now, guys. a5, e4, king e2, and the next move is over. Boom, a5. And then look who arrived. The beast arrived behind the pawn. And before we were looking at it again where Magnus was up a pawn. Now is not the case. Now this pawn is gone. And with the help of the other, this rook will be too passive. The game is actually pretty easy. Black tried to create some counter play here, but no, you got. If you don't get something quick here, it's over. Because I'm promoting, so he tries to go fancy with this uh, and resign. Because then a7, rook takes pawn, and that's it. You can play e3, promote. So it's over. So this is this is the this is the um, this is the this is the position. This is the very nice plan here with the thanks for the, thanks for the beats, guys. Thanks, Nicola. So f4 and that's that was a really nice. So the winning plan a5 rook a4 amazing, creating some awesome 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 uh, uh, back you know back defense and activity. So. Very nice game by Kramnik finishing up Mamediar off there. So we're gonna continue. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, so we're gonna continue with this game where Mamediar of won. Now we've seen game where uh, well it was a win. Both of the the games we saw uh, in both cases, black was up a pawn or white was up a pawn. So being up a pawn is important because okay, that's how you win games, right? But in this case. Black is not uh, is not up a pawn. Black is even. We got we got an even position. We got an even position where uh, black has more activity, and that's that's what we're gonna look into now. So sometimes, like I said before, activity is almost like being up material, and that is why, and that is why uh, black goes rook a4, and boom, a very important move protects the pawn, attacks this guy, makes this rook passive so what can you do you gotta go rook d2 only move to protect your pawns otherwise i would push but i i think m maybe king f2 would have been better uh try to get that guy some 
love and maybe activate the king. That could have been a little better. Instead, he goes rook d2, and then black goes boom, h4, the most important move of the game, possibly. And now black, well, white, as you can see, is passive. Black has to find a way to get in with the king, though. And that will be king f6, g5, and then my king can get active. So king f2, rook a3, another very awesome move to stop g3. I don't want to give anything to white. King f3, king f6, and of course, who's coming now? The monster. Now, maybe maybe Wesley could have given some checks here to complicate things a little. Uh, I think it would have been uh, the answer would have been g5 anyway, because you don't have a check anyway, and then I would take the pawn. So king rook e2 was played, but then g5 is coming. Pawn takes, king takes. First job to create some space for the king. G3, boom e5, no chance. Pawn takes, I take with the king, and then f4 is coming. So look at the activity of this king. Look at the activity of the rook. Black is doing amazing. Then king g2, push. If you go rook f2, I go king here. No chance. I'm not going to trade more pawns. If you play h4, I go king g4. I'm going to ignore that guy because I want to make sure you get passive. And then I take the pawn. So something like this. You need to protect this pawn. And then I take the pawn for free. So we're going to be going around and around. And then now um, I basically created a pass pawn and possibly a second pawn here all right so king e2 rook e2 a4 and finally f4 and this is over now i got two pass pawns and this guy is just too slow on top of that remember the end game that we were looking at where all white have to do is push the pawn to a2 because remember it's not a knight pawn and it's not a rook pawn but that is exactly what we're looking at here look how do you think that Mamediarov came up with this stuff? Because he knows this stuff. So now we, we just look at the game with the bishop. Now what do you do? Well, all you have to do is sack the pawn. So Wesley have to go rook... What just happened here? Well, Wesley have to go rook a3, otherwise I sack. And then I just push my pawn so that I make sure that this king gets out of these two squares. Wasn't that the same endgame that we were looking at before? right there now this proves that if you know end games you will actually understand you will actually understand what's got what's happening on these top guys games of course uh, Wesley resigned he knows the end games very well and he but it would make no difference to continue because at some point you're gonna have to go for the pawn and when that happened I always get a check and promote now, why do you think the first thing was to push the pawn to a2? Because he knows it was an e-pawn. If we would have had the same position with the g-pawn, then the game was gonna was definitely going to be a draw, and Mamediarov would have never pushed to a2. So a very nice, another very nice Mamediarov game where he uses the activity of the rook and the activity of the king to win an even position endgame. Okay? So... Now we're going to look at Nak Hikaru's game uh, versus Mamediarov. Now Mamediarov is the one hitting the, uh, taking the shots here. I know it blitz games, but very nice end game. Uh, y wants to take this guy, but of course uh, B5 is played. And this is going to show you guys another technique of uh, defensive, but also activity of, uh, of a rook. So sometimes you don't have time to go rook b8 in fact sometimes it's bad to have the rook on b8 because it doesn't give black uh, much to do uh, but sometimes you, all you can do is to have the rook on the lateral defense now both of those ways are extremely good for black the worst one would be to have the rook in front of the pawn that's the worst of all you see how this rook is passive but that's what you want you want this rook to be taking care of this pawn so that this guy can be used freely and at the same time, you can bring the king, guys, the king. So what can you do now? Well, why can probably push the king. Well, you know what I'm going to do now, right? I'm just bringing my, my king into the game. Here we go. No, I'm not going to give you a pawn. And I still follow my plan, right? King c5, then push, push, push. You know this one important thing about this rook that is pretty awesome? It's cutting off the king and right there guys you got another very important 
technique on Rook Angeps, the cutting off the king because it doesn't let the king go into the defense. If the king gets here, then it releases this rook from the passivity and now the rook can become active and the rook is a lot more dangerous than the king. So this cut off here is extremely important to win this game. King d6, g4, pawn takes, pawn takes, all of this is kind of forced. Of course g5, I'm not gonna let you get an easy pass pawn. You're gonna have to play a four, only way. And now Hikaru is trying hard, but as you can see, this pawn <coughs> is a lot faster. Well, not a lot, but it is way faster than this guy. So e5, and now boom, b4, b3, e4 to stop that baby for a little bit. And now it gives me more chance to improve my king. And what do I do now? I'm gonna push and hide. And now I'm ready to do the Lucena idea. Remember the Lucena idea we looked at the beginning of this of this game? Well, we're doing it again. Boom, rook b3, rook a3, and the game is over. So, very nice game too. You see, all of these, I mean, there's not really much about rook game games uh, on, on basics. Oh, I, I think I, I pretty much cover a lot of the basics. So guys, if you if you didn't see the, the first part of this of this Rook Engines uh, lesson, you should because then it will help you understand what's happening on these games. It will make everything a lot easier, really. So, um, and again, make sure you follow me for those of you who are late. I did one on King Endgames and I'm, I'm doing now the one on Rook Engines. All of those will be on YouTube. I'm actually gonna separate them, I think, so that you guys see them one king and game and another rook and game and make sure you uh, you check out my YouTube channel. That's where I will be uploading uh, the less the this master class and also any other thing that I do uh, for you guys to see as many times as you need. So make sure you do. All right. So anyway, this one was a very cool end game. I, I uh, very interesting. Most of, uh, most of the time, uh, these these games are winning. Because you got two connected pass pawns. Connected pass pawns are just awesome. And uh, but I still want to show you guys how how Magnus won this. Uh, basically, uh, there's one thing you don't want. No? You don't want to trade this pawn for this pawn for any of these pawns. If you do that, then the game is, is just a dead draw. So you don't want to you don't want to do a trade. But you, what you really want is you wanna you wanna make sure you push those pawns and keep them secure, so that there's never a trade. This rook is, is horrible because it's too passive and you cannot really do anything with it. You just have to kind of hang around there, try to see if you have some luck, give a check or maybe trade the pawn. That's pretty much it. So while this rook takes care of this guy, it also cuts off this king so it helps on the pushing and that's what happened in this game. Why? Uh, actually, Magnus won extremely easily this game. H5 and now I'm going G4, G5, check, promote and then Anytime you go a2, it's extremely important you don't push that, that king like crazy because then when a2 happens, I go back to g2. This is the key. Remember that idea where you don't let this this king, this check, this rook get out with checks or anything like that? No, you go back and now you're free to push those pawns as you wish. So king a7, g4, and now you notice how Magnus, now he went out because uh, this guy allowed him, he should have played a2. And then king g2, and this game is over. Because you have this, uh, well actually no, this is not the way you win. Uh, you have to push the, you have to play king g2, and now you have to play g5. That's the, that's the way to win. But anyway, king g7, and h king h4, and then king g5. Now the king is not even worried about checks, and these guys are going. So king f7, h6, he dropped the pawn, and of course he won the game. So a very simple but very tricky. You just have to you still have to do some work here on how you push those pawns. Uh, but of course the, the activity of this rook is very easy. And let's let's keep going with some more examples here. Uh, another example of distraction. Uh, I want to show you this one because uh, it's not only distraction but also uh, trading advantages. Uh, you're gonna have end games where sometimes you won't be able to win by using one pawn 
and you cannot hang to those pawns. You sometimes you have to give up those pawns, then go get the others. So trading advantages can be a huge deal on these type of uh, angles. So as you can see, these two pawns are very weak, right? So I mean, you can you can probably hold on to one of them, but then um, you're gonna be tied up to that, right? And then white could make these old pawns uh, more solid. So what Bing did is that he he was like, you know what? I'm gonna take I'm gonna take this guy. You're gonna take that guy. But then now I'm not gonna be concerned about this weak pawn that means nothing here. I'm actually gonna go grab uh, the other pawns. And then after some some moves, you, you're gonna see how he ends up also doing the same with these other pawns. So he traded these two isolated pawns on this side for these two pawns on this other side, and that gave him later the wing i mean the the game could have been played better but it is awesome uh how he he i like the idea of trading a lot because sometimes you know you just have to give up on the way on what you do with your uh with you know with your pots you just have to say you know what i'm not gonna win with this one let's go for the other one and he won the game the, the game went on for a long time it actually ended on 108 moves and we are on move um, 49 so a long game I'm not gonna go over the 200 uh, the, the 50 more oh no wait uh, yeah like 70 more moves that they played but uh, the, I'm gonna show you the, the final but it was actually a rook and nine and was is, uh, yeah it was crazy so but okay but a good hassle by by being uh, and, and a, uh, a draw uh, it was a draw position anyway so so continue with Magnus and Dean uh, they played this a uh, for game here and I wanted to show the the defense by Magnus uh, because you you know it's not only about attacking and winning a half a pawn end game, but how do you make a draw when you have a tough position? And this is the case. Uh, Magnus, first first thing, uh, let's go back a little here and, let, and let's look at this. This this position here is very typical of the Slav Grunfeld Slav, the mix of the Slav and the Grunfeld defense. Uh, where white uh, has the technically was supposed to be the bad bishop because all of these pawns are black and white sorry white has the bad bishop because all the pawns are, are bad are, are, are in black but then black has the, and black is supposed to have the good bishop because all the pawns are in white the problem though is that what can this bishop attack and the other problem is that this bishop is blocked by your own pawns so that makes this bishop pretty bad and this bishop actually pretty good because it's, it's taking over the a very nice diagonal. So what happens if black just sits there and let y activate and take that pawn? You're probably gonna get crushed. If you start going bishop fa and I go here and you go here, and then I bring my king, and then I let it trade the bishop and try to get my king here. I mean that would be horrible, very bad for uh, black. So what Magnus does, he's like, you know what? I'm not gonna sit there and wait for you to crash me. I'm gonna go boom, e5. Let's get rid of my bad bishop, and then I'm gonna give I'm gonna give you some uh, some some uh, headache now. He could have done this, this, and this, but then d4 pawn takes and something like that would have given Black some initiative at least. Right, so rook d3 was played, then bishop takes, pawn takes, and still, you notice how black is struggling here. This pawn is hanging. So rook d8 protects the pawn for now. This is only temporary. You cannot stay passive forever. This is only this is only for uh, activating the king and then go for the old pawn. It's, it's just temporary. You cannot again. Passivity is horrible. Boom, king f8 and king e7. So black holds on, not again, not again to your uh, activity. Rook b7, I got rook d7, king d3, rook d7, stopping the seventh rank rook, guys. Remember, remember the seventh rank rook. And now, well, you can go here, but I'm gonna go rook c7. So he plays h4, rook c7, getting ready for checking. I'm also ready, get, getting ready for rook c5, maybe. That's that's because you have rook b7, right? So at the end, well, trading the advantages again. He gets that pawn, I get this guy. They took, check, and then they make a draw like that. So 
This could have been a little more complex if uh, why, black, why did I go on King E2, uncheck, and then that position could have been interesting. But as you can see, uh, Magnus could have hold on. Why, uh, otherwise I would have pushed. And it's not easy to win. This is practically a drawish position. That's why they drew. But again, activity, activity with the king. Uh, don't just sit there, leave your king outside. Guys, you gotta bring your king. Uh, this rook was passive for a temporary moment and then boom activate the rook as soon as you can It is the way you play rook end games and you cannot just sit there All right with either pieces. You only got two pieces left. So use them well wisely and What uh, this one is also a very good. Oh, this is the one that we just saw. Why did it jump? And I think one sec I think no, okay, okay, no, I, I just repeated them for some reason there. All right, so Mama the Out of Carlson, a very awesome game, too, and also another defense. Magnus is just amazing in end games. I, I love the, I love the, um, uh, I love the, the, I mean, he's, he's just definitely to me, he's the best player, end game player in the world for, by far. Uh, so, why goes rook before here, and what are you gonna do here? Would you play bishop c8? Would you play bishop c8 and wait there and maybe bring the king? That could be. You could do that. I'll probably go a4, then you go here and I go a5. And I'm gonna try to play a6. Now, does that look good for you? Uh, no, I don't think so, right? It doesn't look like a fun, it doesn't look like a fun position for you to do this, right? Definitely annoying. And, and of course, I could have also pushed my pawn. Maybe that's the best thing. e4, e5. And then I go, I, I, I go e4, I go e4, e5, I go e4, e5, and uh, just one second, guys. All right. So anyway, so on this one, on this one, uh, it would be it would be really hard for Black to defend this position because you got it, because you got a very a very yeah it kills around, because you got a very a very bad passive position here. So so what did what did uh, Magnus did? Of course, Rook B is not possible because Bishop takes E six. That's another horrible move. So this that's just horrible. And of course, after B, uh, then Magnus goes boom. B6, amazing, amazing move. B6, activating the pawn, the the rook now. If you take on C6, and these these type of moves that you know you can come up with, but you have to understand what you need to do first. You have to understand that you know what you gotta activate, and you know what you don't have another chance. It's either you do it or you lose the game. So why would you give it up? So B6. We should take c6 only move, otherwise then I get active for real. Or I can play c5 at some point and then get active. So we should take c6, boom, rook c8, and now boom takes that pawn. And suddenly things have already changed. Look at this. Check, rook c rook b1, and the pawn is lost. So you can well you can go bishop d7 or you can go here, but I still get the pawn and now I might even be pushing for a little bit of damage here. It would be five before. So bishop d7 and they got into a drawish endgame. This went on for a little more, maybe 10, 15 more moves, but it was it was definitely a, it was an amazing move. B6 by Magnus, killing it, killing it, killing it uh, with this b6, playing active once again. And the guys, this is gonna be, I think, the last game of the day. It's gonna be another draw, but I wanna show you another defensive uh, masterpiece by Magnus. And again, it's all about activity. You gotta mix them up. Uh, why goes King F2, trying to activate. As you can see, Black, why has the seventh rank, seventh uh, rank uh, Rook? And why black goes to rook e7, try to get rid of the rook. If you have a passive rook, trade it by the active one, right? It makes sense. Rook takes, uh, sorry, rook d8 check. Rook e8 takes, takes, 
and then rook d7. So black goes back to being passive because there was no other choice. And now you gotta figure a way to either activate this rook or kick this guy out of here so you can get the rook active again. Why, of, uh, why black goes king e8, rook c7, the best move, keeping up that seventh rank. Hopefully my king is gonna go now that way and might win the game. That's what why he's trying to do. So now, uh, now Magnus found the best move here. Boom, b5, amazing. Creating some awesome counter play. So suddenly, you're not really attacking anything and I'm actually the one who's gonna be attacking something. And if you want to attack this pawn here, I would do the same. Lateral defense is not passive, it's active because it gives me options of going up. And if you play rook c6, which is what happened in the game, now look what Max did. Group a8, another awesome move. Even though it's passive, I want to go king d7, king c7, and then kick that trap, even trap that rook if you go here. So it's all about temporary passivity. You don't want to ever go here and knowing that you're just going to stay there. So c4 was played. There was no other choice for um, car hacking because king e3, king d7 and then the rook is trapped, so you have to get out of here, which makes my passivity uh, gone. This rook e8 is awesome, and then now I get active my rook. So he plays c4, trying to create some, some space for the rook to get out, and now I just get that pawn, and we trade, and this is already a drawage endgame. This game is hard, even if you have an extra pawn here. Imagine if I have the same amount of pawns. I'm out of pawn on this side. It should be a fairly easy draw, and that's why they just uh, decided to repeat. Now, I would suggest uh, you guys, uh, you know, look at the whole class again. Um, I'll make sure you, uh, you know, you learn these basic end games. You have to learn keen end games, or you have to learn rook end games. It's extremely important for you because those are the end games you're gonna find the most on chess games. You might get a bishop endgame one day or a queen endgame one day, but rook endgames and king endgames are super common. Rook endgames are the most common uh, endgames in chess. So you need to have a very, uh, you, it's important to have a basic understanding of them because you're gonna encounter them in a lot of, of your games. So I hope you guys enjoy, enjoy the, the masterclass and uh, make sure you, again, make sure you subscribe to my channel on YouTube so you can see see the whole thing the king m1 and the rook m1 and uh make sure you follow me here or subscribe as well in twitch uh, all, the, all the information is there and uh i i hope i can do i hope i can do another like that soon once we reach a bunch of subscribers <laughs> uh but yeah it was it was fun and i really really appreciate you guys thank you so much Thanks so much for uh, for the for sticking around. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna raid someone. <laughs> but um, I will see you guys. Don't go anywhere. Stick around. I'm gonna 